Okay, it's one minute past uh, 12. I know people are still arriving, uh, but we've got lots to cover. So I think we should uh, start. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Metro Mayor's Hustings, focused on the West of England's economy, its strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Today's event is a part of a series of hustings that the Centre for Cities is running with areas that are elected Metro Mayors in just over a week's time. Um, I'd like to thank Business West for working with us to put on today's event. And I'm going to invite Richard Bonner, who is the president of British, uh, Business West, to say a few words of welcome and context. Richard, over to you. Andrew, thank you very much for, for working with us on, on today's hustings. We're really delighted to work with Centre for Cities. I'd like to welcome all of our Chamber Business West initiative members and the business community more widely. We know that we've got strong interest in today's hustings. Our role as the Chamber of Commerce is to really listen to, to our members and to the community more widely. And we hope that the questions that are being raised today resonate with colleagues on the call. It's really been led by the issues that we see and our members see across the region. We know that um, the business community and certainly Business West have really advocated for a West of England mayor. And we were really pleased that the devolution deal was struck those years ago. We wanted to take more control locally. And we know that a successful mayor with strong advocacy for the region is really, really important for us. And we'd like to thank all four candidates for joining us today, taking the time out of their busy schedules to come and engage with us and our members. Earlier on this year, we undertook some research across our membership to really think about the issues that were important for us across the West of England. And that helped us to shape our business manifesto, which we recently launched. And through that manifesto, we identified six key themes. We really are looking for a strong mayor who will advocate for the city and the city region, who will be able to politically engage and create great advocacy for the region. We know that transport and connectivity is vital, and that is one of our key thematic issues and areas for improvement. Delivering housing at scale is vitally important. And of course, ensuring that we've got the planning framework to enable that is equally critical. Supporting the recovery of growth from an economic perspective is vital, both for our businesses and our, and our employers. And leading to a post-pandemic recovery, thinking about the transitions in, in skills, thinking about the transition for business and the investment that's needed to create a vibrant economy for the future is, is really important. And finally, we have large areas of inequality across our city region. And we know that helping to deliver a skills agenda that reaches those hard to get to communities and transitioning those people who need to pivot to new jobs for our economy is vitally important. So those are the six issues that we want to focus on. Can I just say that we really look forward to working with a successful mayor and we hope that we can work with you to hit the ground running in a week or so's time. And good luck to all four of you. Thank you. And Andrew, back to you. Great. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard. So as, as Richard said, we have our four candidates uh, with us today, ready to make their pitch and answer your questions. Uh, let me introduce them. So we've got Dan, Mor uh, Dan Norris, who's representing the Labour Party. Jerome Thomas, uh, representing the Green Party. Stephen Williams, from Liberal Democrats and Samuel Williams from the Conservatives. And before we dive in and hear from our candidates, let me just say something about how the event will run. Uh, to the audience, um, keep your microphones on mute during the, uh, during the event, unless you are called by me to ask a question, then, then you'll be prompted to unmute and ask your question. In a minute, I'm gonna ask each candidate to make their opening statement for up to two minutes and no more on their priorities for support in the West of England economy. Uh, the order was randomly determined uh, and I'll be timing these uh, and I'll give a wave and the old fashioned wave when you've got about 20 seconds less. I was saying to candidates before and all the other hustings that we've done, all our candidates have been very well behaved. I'm sure colleagues on the call will do so as well. And then we'll get into questions of which we've had uh, loads. Uh, we'll get you to ask your question uh, mainly. There are one or two that I've been asked to ask and I will do that will take one question at a time and each candidate will get a chance to answer. We won't get through them all because we've had uh, lots and lots, but we will get through hopefully a, a good number and we'll be done and dusted by 
by two o'clock. And then the final thing to say is the event is being recorded and will be made uh, will be available after the event on our website, centerforcities.org. So, so just give you a sense of the running order. Dan's going to go first, then Jerome, then Stephen, then Samuel. So Dan, you're going to be up. So if you can get ready, unmute. Now you're prompted. And give me a wave as to when you're ready. I will start the stopwatch and you will have your two minutes. Okay. You're ready to go? Well, I'm, I'm ready uh, to go. So let's In go. Okay, let's go. Well, look, thank you very much, everybody, for inviting me here today to speak to you. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to all the candidates today. Um, I know you've got a whole series of questions coming up, so I'm going to let that be the agenda that you want to determine in terms of what I answer. But I want to say a few things in the two minutes that I've got, please, um, about what I think is important for the Wetter Wetter Mayor to be and to do. Um, firstly, I agree with many of the points in your manifesto. I hear from talking to businesses uh, and the business community just how frustrated you've been over a number of years now uh, in terms of not feeling that the Metro Mayors have the profile and, and promoted the region in the way that you want and need. And I agree with you completely, and I will work hard to change that. Uh, I hope that the reasons I would be good at that is because I am genuinely local. I've lived here all my life, uh, not just as an adult like the other candidates, but also growing up here. Uh, I've experienced in politics, I've been a minister, an MP, uh, a councillor in Bristol too, uh, and I've, I've, I've had a governing role across all three council areas, so I think that's quite important to understand how those communities work and those politics work. Um, I've had the experience at the highest level in, in government in the sense of dealing with Northern Ireland peace process and negotiating with some very difficult people. I think that experience is probably quite useful given some of the tensions that we've had in the past in the West of England area. Uh, I suppose the key thing I want to say is that I've seen generations of local politicians and I was a, a politician as a councillor very young uh, and I was frustrated too, like many of you are in business, uh, watching the, the lack of ambition very often that, that occurred for our region. Um, and I include my own party in that. Uh, I think we weren't ambitious enough. I think that's changing and I'm glad about that and I would want to change that too. Uh, I, my attitude to business is one that I have full respect for the risks that people take, particularly when they're starting out in business. Uh, and I do aware, I'm completely aware of that and appreciate and respect that. Uh, and our, my objective is to get us back on the national stage initially and clearly the global stage so we can be the force that we need to be. Very good. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Dan. So second up is Jerome. So if you can Get yourself ready, Jerome, unmute. And when you're ready, just give me a nod and I will start the stopwatch. Good, away you go. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you everybody here today. Um, I think that I want to start by just explaining a little bit about the, the Metro Mayor role. So we know that it's got South Glossy, we know it's got Baines, we know it's got Bristol, we know it doesn't include Somer North Somerset or the airport. We know that the responsibilities are planning for homes, transport and jobs in the region. And it's got a minimum, minimum budget of about 30 million a year. So it's, it's a significant amount, but not a huge amount. And that comes direct from gov national government. In reality, the budget's likely to be about double that. And it's very important to remember, and I think this is one of the things that comes from looking at the questions that have been put today. It's a much more collaborative role in its design than the Bristol mayoral role, for example. Pretty much full consensus is needed across the constituent authorities for, for money to be spent. So those skills of brokering deals and being able to work with people across political parties and having realistic ambitions um, is really important. In terms of my background and political journey, I grew up in a farming community in rural Gloucestershire, went to comprehensive school um, in Chipping Camden and, and from there to Oxford University where I studied politics, philosophy and economics. And from a young age, as somebody with political interest, I believe that to make effective political change, you need politicians, businesses and people understanding each other and working together. And after university, I work for a management consultancy with the aim of gaining that business understanding. And then I founded a business, a safety business, which I was managing director of until I became a councillor in 2015. And that's a national business with, with, with over 80 staff. So I've got the kind of strong understanding of business and the experience to understand and lead larger organization, organizations which professional politicians often don't have um, in, their, in their work training. I moved to Bristol in the early 90s with my wife, Catherine, who works as a, a GP locally, as a doctor. Yeah. And it's 
been an amazing place to live and raise a family. Um, and it's one where I want to play my part in making sure that the quality of life is as good here as it is, um, as it has been for me and my family. Okay. Um, I'll say a little bit more later. The sink, right. we'll, we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no. But yeah. Very good. Um, uh, okay. Can I just quickly say, I've been a Green Party councillor in Bristol since 2015. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can say you can definitely say that again as well if, if you saw uh, yeah. Wish. So, Stephen, uh, you're up. If you just unmute. There we go. And when you're ready, you crack on and I'll press the stopwatch. I'm ready. Yep. Yeah, go. Well, hello, hello, everybody. It's great to be at this event with Business West and, and Centre for Cities, two organisations I've worked with closely in, in the past. To make a success of this role, I think you ought to look for someone with, with three qualities or three attributes. First of all, the region needs someone who has a deep understanding of our regional economy. Unlike most of the other metro regions, we're, we're a mixture of a large city, a smaller city, and over 100 towns and villages. And our economy reflects that as well. We've got some world-class uh, brands and companies, and we've got hundreds of thousands of small businesses as well. For the 17 years before I became a member of parliament in 2005, I was a business consultant with PwC uh, and then Grant Thornton, working with companies large and small right across the region, all the way from the Summer Valley uh, up, up into South Gloucestershire and indeed beyond into the real economic uh, hinterland of, of, of Bristol into Gloucestershire itself and West Wiltshire as well. So I've got a good understanding of the structure of the local economy. And for the two terms that I was a member of parliament for the city centre of Bristol, as well as spending a lot of time with public sector organisations, I made sure that each week in my constituency, I spent time with a business in Bristol or sometimes further afield as well to keep my knowledge up to date. I think the second thing you want is somebody with a plan. Uh, I've got a detailed manifesto. It's on my website, stephenwilliams.org.uk, and I'll put a link uh, in the chat to that in a moment. And the good news is that there is a lot of congruence in between my manifesto and what Centre for Cities are calling for the next mayor to do and what Business West want us to do as well. But ultimately, you need someone with the leadership skills that's been lacking for the last four years and the political skills as well to bring us together. I've been an MP. A minister, I've worked with all parties in Parliament, and of course was a minister in a coalition government. I'm used to working with others, I like collaboration, and I like strong leadership. Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephen, for opening comments. Uh, and our fourth candidate, Samuel, uh, when you're ready, let me know and I will start the stopwatch. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, I think I'm ready. Good. Uh, okay, and go. thank you all, uh, Business West, the Initiative and uh, Centre for Cities for today. Uh, and thank you for all of those uh, of you who are present, our local business leaders, government leaders, those interested and committed to seeing our economy recover uh, the, and, and the creation of new jobs and driving uh, this region forward. And that's ultimately what we all want, isn't it? And that's certainly my ambition for the region, to see our economy recover, to see the creation of new jobs, of green jobs uh, in innovative new areas, to deliver the transport system that we need, uh, joining up what is currently a very disjointed network, uh, and building homes and communities that uh, prioritise uh, local living uh, and businesses that we want to start and run. And I, this is a good ambition, of course, and I think it's an ambition that uh, many of you will agree with. But it's really important that we have someone who understands how the economy, how business works and runs, and how to work with government and the public sector to unlock investment for the region. I started my business in the region, I've created jobs in the region, I've worked internationally in international trade and economic growth. I know that we need someone who can work with you as business leaders, because that's where the answers are going to come from. You, innovative business leaders, not from politicians, not from government. We need someone who can unlock the investment, deliver the future that we need, working closely with you. And I'm that person. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Good. Thank you very much, candidates, for your opening statements. Um, so let's move on to... Uh, to our questions and our first question comes from Victoria Matthews from uh, Business West. Victoria, 
If you're ready, away you go. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, obviously, for coming and thank you to the candidates for your time. So to kick things off, my question to each of you is, what is the first major decision you want to make if elected? Thank you. Very good. Good question. So the first major decision in relation to the economy that you will make if you get uh, elected. Samuel, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, th thank you, Victoria. And this is a really easy one for me. It's not, uh, it's, it's not going to be simple to deliver. There are many areas that we need to, of course, uh, engage with. We need to make sure that, that jobs of the future are delivered on and that we have jobs for those who have sadly uh, lost them during this awful pandemic. But how do we get the economy going? We need to get our region working closely together. And that's why I'll be picking up the phone very quickly to government so that we can get North Somerset in, we can get Somerset in, we can get Gloucestershire in. And uh, I'm delighted I was speaking with Robert Jenerick just this week, just yesterday, and raising devolution with him so that we can unlock more investment in the region. And I'll be working closely with the Western Gateway as well, bringing together those leaders so that we can get the economy going, building collaboration, building partnership. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Stephen. Stephen, the first thing you would do uh, on election uh, to help the economy? Um, th the first thing, first decision I, I, I would make is, that, is actually to do with our transport. I'd stop officers working on building new roads and I'd start them on the process of, of bus franchising. So that's the first decision and they're two quite easy decisions to make. But in terms of the economy, the pandemic has hit some sectors far harder than, than others in both Bath and Bristol. Hospitality, tourism and retail have been particularly battered. So I would gather together, and this is an example of where you use the soft power of the mayor, I would gather together all the leading players in all of those sectors and ask them what they need quickly uh, from me, what they need quickly from the three local authorities, what they need from central government uh, in order to help them to bounce back as quickly as possible. One example might be asking for the devolution of full control of business rates to our area so that we can incentivize the high streets uh, and hospitality in a way that we're not able to do at the moment. Uh, one of the things that current regional mayor has not done is ask for new powers. Uh, I've got a whole suite of things I want to ask central government for us to do in the West Country so that we can be on a par with other city regions that have seen a, a devolution process rather than a frozen event in 2017, which is pretty much what we've had here. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Jerome, first big decision? The, just... first thing, the first thing is the sort of area where the, the Metro Mayor only has indirect responsibility, which is opposing the expansion of Bristol Airport. Um, it's not compatible with the carbon goals that we have got for our economy and two of the three constituent authorities are already opposed to it but we haven't seen the leadership from the current metro mayor on that and all the existing parties in the region have been far too muted in weka about what their approach is um, to central government with regards to the appeal on the airport the other thing is is that we've got budget decisions to make fairly quickly um, in terms of about 30 million pounds and the priority there for me is trying to start investing in some of the future areas of growth in our economy. And th so the ones that I would highlight would be our food sector, um, which is a really important part of economic development and our sustainability goals, working much more close, having getting funding in place for community land organisations, so that there's a much stronger community flavour in our, in our housing. Um, and then investing in the capability to be developing our cycling and walking infrastructure. We're not going to be able to do that in an ambitious way unless we've got the people in place reasonably early in my first term of office. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Dan, let's hear from you, first big decision. Well, I broadly agree with both the Liberal and the Green candidate in terms of what they're saying. Uh, but what I think the key thing is to say to government that there's been a change of power in our region. There's going to be a different attitude because we have missed out hugely. I know it's something that's frustrated you and your members. Uh, things like the Freeport, High Streets, 
town money, all the devolved monies that were supposed to come to us, we've missed out on. The budget had nothing for us whatsoever. So they need to know there's going to be a change, uh, that we are not going to roll over and just accept that. I think it's been far too cosy and in consequence, we've been overlooked. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that there's any need to be uh, impolite or rude, but they do need to know that there's a change. Uh, and you can see the effective Metro mayors that have worked well uh, have been people like Andy Burnham, where it's been totally courteous, but absolutely firm, clear, resolute for his region, determined that people know the arguments, determined to know that his communities matter and that he is not going to roll over and just take it lying down. In other words, if government don't live up to their promises, there will be a consequence. Uh, and that's very, very important. So that's the first thing I would be doing. Okay, very good. So actually our second uh, question picks up on some of those um, issues. It comes from Catherine Finn. Uh, Catherine uh, has asked me to, to pose it to you and it, it is this. If you are the Metro Mayor, how will you ensure that the West of England does not lose out for investment in light of government's decision not to award a free port to the region? So she's using free port in some respects as a broader sort of sense that the government's agenda doesn't look west into into Bristol and beyond and is actually focused uh, north into other reasons uh, that we know about. So how would you do that? Uh, you would want to do it, but actually, how would you do it? Let's hear from Jerome first. What would you practically be doing to engage and make sure that you're not forgotten, Jerome? Uh, I think that, well, first of all, is just make sure that um, in a sort of professional way, we are applying for all the pots of money that are going that tend to turn up from time to time uh, and that we are ticking the boxes that we need to. And, you know, and there are boxes that we can tick on the levelling up fund. So I think there's, there's going through the motions on that. I think the second thing is really building on the business and creative assets in our region and the, the, the green strength in society and our economy. Um, as the government starts to paint a picture of a green future, it's rather countercultural for them. Um, conservatives don't really understand how to how to create a green economy that's that's got strong roots in community. I'm not, they understand some parts of it, but but I think it's something that we've got particular strengths at in the in the west of England in terms of our green businesses and our professional businesses and our universities, and there are examples. Um, like um, congestion charging, for example, where we've got tech and mobility based businesses who would really be able to demonstrate um, national leading, if not global leading ways in which we can create a, a, a smart green economy. And I think that government can be persuaded by the sheer skill and endeavour that we have got here, that this is a place where good ideas can turn into, into reality. Um, and I think that by, as well as that, by building consensus across our different authorities in areas like active travel, where the government wants to give money away, at the moment, we've got political leaders who are not able to come to government and say, do you know what, we can spend the money that you've got on offer, um, because they're, they're not joined up enough and they're not clear enough about how you get that green economy. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, John. Dan, you touched on it just towards the end of that last one. Just how would you actually go about making sure that the government's eyes are, are not averted elsewhere and that they give you the due regard that you that you would want? Well, what you need to be is an iron fist in a velvet glove. They have to know that there is a consequence of not going along with you. And that's been the opposite of what's been happening in the last four years, as, as many of your members have told me. Um, so what I think it needs is somebody who understands how decisions are made in Westminster and Whitehall. Um, and the reality is that uh, thinking that you can just pick up the phone <laughs> or just knock on the door because you're in the same party as government and you'll get what you want is very naive, frankly. Uh, I know from having been a, obviously a Labour uh, MP in a Labour government, the way I got things that I wanted in my constituency was not always to cooperate, to always have some consequence if, if it didn't go my way. And that's what we need. So we need to have change as well in our own communities. I would ask you as a, as a business community to be different in the way that you've been over the last four years, to work closely together with the mayor in a different way. 
Uh, I think it's very important that we are seen as unified and together as a region. Uh, I think the spatial strategy decision was very damaging for us in terms of how the government views our region. I think we are looked at as the last of all the regions, I'm afraid. Uh, so that means we've got to, first of all, ask, because if we don't ask for things we won't get, so we need to ask for more money, we need to ask for more powers, we need to do that, not just because the mayor is asking for it, but because all the community is bought into that and can demonstrate that. Uh, and I also think um, I have to accept that I will have to make changes and so will my party because it isn't just about you and the other communities making changes that we need to get back on the map and be recognized nationally and globally but my party also has to make changes as well we have to accept that you know sometimes we've got things wrong uh, and that we have to forge ahead with different attitudes uh, and a better co collaboration with business and the concerns of business and the risks that business take because actually i believe we have a mutual uh, overlap that if you create wealth, that allows me to do all the things that I'm also concerned about as a Labour person, about compassion and fairness and not having rough sleepers. So it's in my interest for my other agendas as a Labour person that you guys are able to create the wealth and have the opportunities to do that and have the support to do that so that uh, I can do the other things I want to see as well. Very good. OK, thank you very much. Stephen, how do you make sure that the government just doesn't uh, ignore uh, you uh, and this area, particularly in the levelling up agenda, which typically looks uh, into the Midlands and the North. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that is our problem, that the current Conservative government has talked a lot about the Northern powerhouse, West Midlands engine, and nothing at all for us uh, here in the West of England. And of course, the other side of the seven, uh, we've got a very active Welsh government as well. So it's, it's not just the English regions that we're suffering in proportion to, it's in comparison to, it's, it's, it's over over our near border as well. So you need a Metro Mayor who understands how the system works. I absolutely agree with, with Dan on that front. It's This is not a job for someone who is going to be learning on the job for the next four years. Doing the coalition, I, I was vice chair of the cabinet committee on local growth sitting with Greg Clark and Michael Heseltine on looking at all the, the bids that were made to central government for the pots of money that were available. But I don't want the West of England just to be a bidder uh, to be a receptacle for money that comes down the conveyor belt almost automatically from London. I think we have to be far more ambitious than that. So I would like to set up the equivalent of the regional investment funds that are available uh, in the Northwest and are available in, in the West Midlands and set up a West of England investment fund to put us on a par uh, with those regions that would be administered by the British Business Bank uh, that was set up by Vince Cable when we were in coalition. We've got a lot of ground to make up on other areas as well. Transport investment is the obvious one. So I'll be making a case for the government is spending billions on high speed rail, is spending billions on, on Transpennine links as well, but hardly anything uh, in our region. We need rail electrification finished through to Bristol Temple Meads and Western Supermare and for the line to Cardiff from Temple Meads to be electrified as well. And those big investments is what I would be championing locally and making the case for in London. Okay, very good. And Samuel, how would you make sure that if you were the, the mayor that the, the national government doesn't ignore uh, the city region? Yeah, th thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Catherine, for the, for the question. I think firstly, in, the instant, uh, in this instance, we need to be very clear in laying out our ambition for the region. Uh, resetting that vision for a, a region that has a thriving economy, building upon the fact that we are already a hugely profitable and productive region uh, across the country. We know that, but we also recognize that there are some significant challenges. There's some productivity issues around how we're making the most of, of trade, both uh, domestically and internationally. And so, building uh, greater trade links. And I would continue to uh, work with uh, the Department of International Trade, uh, work that's already been undergoing with the LEP and WECA, so that we develop stronger international uh, relations and trade um, with, with people like the UAE, who are looking to invest in this country and see our region as a place of huge opportunity. So we need to set our, our ambition. We need to work greater in collaboration. I mentioned this earlier, working uh, much more firmly with the Western Gateway and building greater relationships between uh, business groups so that the government sees uh, our ambition and how we're working together. And, uh, and 
Stephen's absolutely right that we need to see that as a whole region, uh, including uh, South Wales in this uh, instance, uh, certainly for some of our big industries, uh, they see it as a single region. Um, and then also it needs to be about leveling up. We need to lay, uh, lay out our agenda for understanding how we are going to level up the region. And I'm delighted that I raised this directly with the Secretary of State yesterday, how we can unpack funds for this region. And the devolution white paper, which will be replaced with the leveling up white paper due to be announced by the PM later this year, will be uh, uh, unpacking how we can access that greater level of funding that we need. And I think it's really important, my last point, is to make this. Who do we see who is delivering for a region as a regional mayor? Who do we see who was elected in a May and was in number 10 with the PM in the June? It's Andy Street uh, in the West Midlands, someone with a private sector background, someone connected with government, someone who knows how to build an economy and unlock opportunity for a region. And that's what I want to see. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, Samuel. We all look forward to the uh, the promised white papers when they uh, when they arrive with with Ernest. Uh, let's move to our next question. It picks up on again some of the points that you've made. This is a question from Carl Tucker. Carl, are you on the call? If you are, just uh, you'll get prompted to unmute, unmute your microphone and ask your question. If you're on the call, Carl. Hi, hi, Andrew. Hi, hi good. everybody. Fire um, away. Thank you. Uh, how would the candidates propose moving the Weka area towards a low carbon economy, please? Thank you very much indeed, Carl. Nice short question. So let's assume that all candidates agree that we need to move towards a low carbon economy. So don't don't explain the need for it. Tell us about what you would be doing in order to achieve it. And let's go to Stephen first. Uh, hi, Carl. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, it turns out we can't post in the chat, so I can't post a copy of my manifesto in there for you all to see. But if you could see it, it's on my website, stephenwilliams.org.uk, and it's called Agenda 2030. And that's because all of the ideas in there, and there are over 100 of them, are predicated on making the West of England the country's first carbon neutral economy by 2030, insofar as I'm able to do uh, as, as the regional mayor. One of the things I'd, I'd like to do, and this is one of my headline policies, is create a West of England Centre for Green Technological Excellence. We'll be bringing together our four universities, our further education colleges, private sector skills providers, and some of our world-class innovative companies together virtually in, in, in the first instance to collaborate on discussing what the products might be, what the services might be, and crucially what the training packages that we need uh, in order to get us to that carbon neutral future. And ultimately, I think that could be a physical center that would drive innovation and research uh, in our region. So we become known uh, in this country and, and around the world as a leading innovator in transitioning swiftly because we are running out of time, 2035, 2040, 2050 is too, too late, how we can transition swiftly and fairly in a socially just way to a carbon neutral economy. I want to make sure that everyone in the West of England knows what they can do to make that transition personally, what their business can do, but I also want to make sure that people who feel it's difficult for them are given the information, are if necessary, given the means to make that transition too. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Samuel? What would you be doing to get us towards a, a low carbon uh, economy in the Wecker area? Yeah, so thank you. Um, thank you, Carl, for the question. It's, it is absolutely vital, yes. Uh, and we don't need to go over why it is. I think we understand why. But uh, organizationally, I would be uh, looking to introduce the, uh, a, a sustainable development goal lens to everything that, uh, uh, that the combined authority does, from planning to, uh, to business growth, uh, to uh, uh, transport and, and all of the other bits and pieces so that sustainability sits at the heart of the decisions that are being made. I think that's really important. Secondly, we need to invest in innovation and we need to drive that forward. As a region, we are globally leading in some instances in green tech, in agri-tech, in, um, in sustainable innovations. And I would look to invest further in that. I was with uh, the Secretary of State for Environment, George Eustace, yesterday with Dale Vince, uh, the founder of Ecotricity, and we were out at one of uh, Dale's wind farms looking at what the future of green energy looks like. And it's so important that we can work together with businesses and with government so that we unlock the infrastructure we need to innovate the, the future green 
uh, jobs and the like. Uh, I would like to train for future green jobs. We need to use that skills budget so that we start training for the jobs of the future. And I'd be looking to start a, what I'm calling currently a collaborative future skills forum, because that will enable us to link employers, apprenticeship providers, and uh, the education sector so that we understand where the skills will need to be and how we train for it. And lastly, I'll be looking to launch a Builder Brighter World Award so that we can attract more investment into those fantastic innovations, uh, opportunities that there are, that the world is looking to invest in, and it's right for us to say we're open and ready for business. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Samuel, Dan, what would you be doing as mayor to get us towards a low carbon economy? Well, I think that what really is needed is to have a whole different language so that we take the public with us because if we're going to achieve a low carbon economy we have to make it easy for people to do the right thing and we're going to have to if we're serious about the co2 emissions targets we've set a, a net zero target for 2030 if we are serious about reaching that that means that year on year we have to cut our co2 emissions by 20 percent on average uh, and that means that people have got to go along with us they've got to be involved they've got to feel that it's relevant and support that uh, and i think that we have to literally use a different language um you know when i hear the other candidates and i do that regularly these days as you'll imagine what i hear is all about jargon and, and they're going to set this group up in that group what we need to do is move away from jargon and groups what we need to do is directly communicate with the communities out there who need to change their behaviors uh, and my feeling is that you know we shouldn't be talking about things like active travel we should be talking about walking and cycling so that every woman and man in the street is part of the discussion because the truth is and you all know this better than me in some ways that the infrastructure that is required uh, will take time to come uh, it, you know the metro med doesn't deal with quick delivery usually it's usually medium to long term and in order for that to be successful, you have to take the public with you so that they're patient, so that you set expectations that are appropriate, so that they don't get frustrated to say they haven't seen anything change or happen. So that's the, the key thing, I would say. Um, and then obviously all the things that you, you, we need. If we are serious about changing the energy source, how we heat our homes and businesses, um, we need to have used the skills budget, definitely, so that we've got the people who can fit heat pumps, who can support them and, and maintain them once they're in. Uh, we've got to uh, make sure that we, um, how is it, we've got to kind of retrofit, I guess, is the, is the most important thing, because although, of course, there'll be new technologies and we'll want to embrace them, you know, we are producing, we lose twice as much heat from our buildings or three times as much as Scandinavia and German homes and, and, and offices do. Mm -hmm. So we need to get the quick fix. So look, I could rattle on. I hope that answers your question in general. Okay, thank you very much. And Jerome, uh, how, do we, how do you get us as the mayor towards a, a low carbon economy? What would you be doing? Yeah, uh, and thank you, Carl, for that question. I think that other candidates talk about almost as if we need a white heat of technology revolution um, in order to be able to make the changes that we need to make. Actually, the technologies that we need are already with us to make the, the changes that we need to make for the, for the low carbon future. So whether it's wind turbines or batteries or linked to that, uh, electric cars um, or energy efficiency measures, we, we simply need the, the, the political will and that clear sense of, the clear sense of direction in, in order to be able to move things towards a low carbon economy. And if we look at our energy consumption, um, Dale Vince was mentioned, I mean, in his very good book, Manif Manifesto, I mean, he, he, he talks about um, the transport sector and what's needed to reduce emissions there and the food sector. And in the, in the transport sector, the typical person in this country has got, has got emissions of about eight to 10 tonnes a year. Well, two tonnes of that are often our cars. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to find a way to be able to get people in this region out of their cars. And we know that that needs the sort of the, the reduction in, in car use, whether that comes, I expect there'll be other questions on transport further down the line, so I'm not going to go into to, too, too, too much detail, but the, the restriction on car use and the investment in the alternatives. Um, and on food, so much could so much more could be done in terms of progress to a low carbon economy 
if we ate locally, you know, if we grew our food locally and we consumed locally. But if you look at, for example, the composition of the LEP, mm -hmm. I can't see anybody on the LEP who comes from a food background. You know, the businesses of the future that we need aren't being represented there yet. We've got the businesses who play such an important role in our economy now, but let's, let's make sure that we're resourcing those sectors where the technology is clear and we, we can bring people with us to, to, to get the, the future that we need. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jerome. So we're gonna to move to a couple of questions on issues related to housing. The first one is from Tom Selway. Tom, are you on the call? We weren't sure if you were. You posted your question and said you would, but we're not sure now if you are. If, if you are, try to unmute and then we'll, we'll find you. If not, I will ask his question. And then we've got a follow-up related question from Charlie Bendin, who I can see is definitely on the call because he's on the screen in front of me. So uh, Tom hasn't tried. So let me just read Tom's question out uh, and we'll get some reactions and then I'll get Charlie to come in as well. So Tom's question is, with the growing importance of sustainability, reducing congestion, getting people out of cars and taking some of the pressure off the towns in the area that have seen significant housing growth, is it time to review Bristol's green belt. So Metro Mayor, you will have some role and responsibility in planning. This is one of the areas undoubtedly that you will have to think carefully about. Uh, Dan, is it time to review Bristol's green belt as part of dealing with the housing problem? Well, I think we have to, I mean, the Labour government of 1945 created uh, the green belt, obviously, and protected the countryside very, very effectively. Uh, but I think there are anomalies in it. I think that it doesn't always meet uh, the purpose. It kind of sometimes resists appropriate development and change that we will certainly have to address in the future if we're going to hit the CO2 emissions targets and, and the concerns that raised by Tom uh, in his question. Uh, so I think it has to be constantly under review. I don't think you can ever say this is a fixed point. This is how it's going to be. This is how it must stay. What we firstly obviously have to do is make sure that we develop brownfield sites uh, as a first priority at every opportunity and make the most of that and I'm sure that there is lots of land that can be used in a different way uh, that could benefit uh, the opportunities for house house building um, but it does strike me that what we really need is a discussion a debate around housing and where it goes across the west of England because there are these competing tensions and I'm acutely aware of them having lived in, and grown up in, in the three different council areas and been a politician in all three that there are always suspicions about Bristol being this overarching powerful body that will encroach everywhere and cause all sorts of problems uh, and there are some genuine concerns there that I, I understand and identify but also uh, re reversely there is also a lot of wealth that comes out of the Bristol city region area um, that, that goes to the outer communities and they need to carry their bit of the changes that are needed for the future. So it's about how you handle that and how you manage that. And I just think that um, my experience of having been an MP, a Labour MP in what has been a traditionally conservative seat for a very long time, in fact, I don't think there'd ever been a Labour MP there before I was there. Um, uh, and the fact that I was re-elected on several occasions and only lost because they changed the boundaries tells you that I'm probably quite adept at dealing with differences uh, and differences of opinion and different priorities, but okay. bringing people together to be successful. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Jerome, is it time to review Bristol's green belt? Um, I think it is. Um, and I mean, we talk about Bristol's green belt. A lot of Bristol's green belt is in South Gloucestershire or North Somerset or Bath and North East Somerset. So it's a it's a great example of why we need a regional approach. Um, and as we kind of go through this election process, I and I'm sure the other candidates are approached by people saying, please, no development here. Can you <laughs> can you support us in our opposition to development X, Y and Z? Um, so what what we need is that sense that we we've got a regional identity. You, you, you might live in Thornbury, but but work in in Bristol or or vice versa, um, and we need our political representatives and our communities to be able to say this is a shared problem uh, and one where what what might be called Bristol's green belt is actually part of some of the least desirable parts of North Somerset 
where they might be quite happy. I mean, I've, I don't want to, no, no. Very, one gets into very hot water very quickly when, when, when talking about these things. But I mean, there are, you know, the Ashton Vale and the extension of Ashton Vale would be an area where we're recognising that the challenge of needing more homes for our, you know, for our young people, for the crisis of affordability. Um, and by, by working together uh, with local councils, with communities, across the region, I do think we, we need to find a way forward in terms of reviewing the appropriateness of the green belt. Okay, very good. So I think two of you saying yes with lots of other things on top, but yes. Samuel, uh, time to review the green belt. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I think <laughs> Jerome's, uh, I, I value Jerome's honesty that one gets into hot water very quickly uh, with these uh, issues. Fundamentally, uh, I will do everything I can to safeguard our green belt, our green spaces. But I think it's really important to note that since the 1970s and the Green Belt Act, the Green Belt has doubled, more than doubled in size, and the Green Belt exists for certain things to, uh, to stop urban sprawl, to protect our neighboring, um, maybe more historic towns or um, historic uh, characteristics, and to enable urban regeneration. And I think that's the important point that I want to highlight there, secondly, is that my prioritization, is, which I'd rather focus on, rather than saying, what do we, how do we treat the green belt? Where do we prioritize? My prioritization is absolutely about brownfield regeneration. But Jerome raised a really important point as well, which is actually there are some areas that are designated green belt, which are not necessarily uh, full of life or delivering on the, uh, in terms of biodiversity, or delivering on the, the, the five marks of, of Greenbelt. However, there are some brownfield sites that absolutely are teeming with life and uh, biodiversity. And, and therefore, I think it's right that we do keep uh, an open, uh, open dialogue around how we treat the Greenbelt, and importantly, how we meet this enormous target of potentially 120,000, maybe more new homes for our region, uh, over the next 20 years and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's really important to note that it's about our region it's not about bristol homes and south cross homes and baines homes it's about delivering as a whole region to meet the needs of the region okay very good well i think that, that charlie's question will pick up a little bit of this uh in in a bit more detail in in a second St stephen just uh just to sort of complete the your view on is it time to review the bristol's green belt albeit it's much of it is not in bristol but nevertheless some of it is is it time to review it um yes it is um and let's not forget we've got two cities with green belts here I keep mentioning bristol but actually bath, bath has a as, green well. Belt as yeah. well if anything yeah. that that green belt is rather more significant in preserving the character of the world heritage city um i think belts around both our cities and some of our towns do need to be maintained to stop sort of an agglomeration in, into one amorphous mass of of urbanism, so I wouldn't want Salford and Canesham, for instance, to, to merge into each other, and I certainly wouldn't want the town of Canesham to merge into Brislington, uh, a, a South Bristol suburb, and effectively become an urban extension of Bristol. So I think the belts not only have an ecological uh, uh, need, but also they preserve the character of place in certain settings as well. But we can identify where those settings are, whereas in large parts of North and East Bristol, um, I don't think that applies, and that's where I would look to review where there are opportunities to, to build, because the least sustainable thing we could do is to leap the green belt in North Bristol and plonk all of the housing demand uh, requirements onto towns in the northern part of South Gloucestershire, such as Thornbury, Yate, Chipping Sodbury, Charfield, and so on. That is the least sustainable thing for us to do. And there are lots of plans to expand those places that would completely alter their character. And I would rule those out uh, in the new spatial development strategy that the new Metro Mayor will urgently need to come up with. Okay. But there are some areas around the edges of Bristol, south of the M4, uh, if you like, an obvious area would be around Pilning Station, a station that de desperately needs more trains to call at it, and I think it's more likely to have more trains calling at it if there are lots of new houses built near to it. So I think that is certainly one area uh, that could be looked at for a large amount of growth and of course around the, the former Filton airfield as well, which also needs a new station. Uh, lots more new housing could go in that area. Okay, very good. So let, let's take up uh, a little bit more of that, that detail. Charlie, 
uh, Bendin, you, you've got you've got a question which is about affordability and the challenges of it in the area. Charlie, un unmute and ask your your question. Great, thanks, Andrew. The likes of Bath and Bristol are two of the most expensive cities in the country relative to salaries to get on the property ladder. It's clearly important that we continue to attract new business and talented individuals to our area. How do you propose to address this anomaly? So there we are, in a sense that the housing challenge, we see it in the affordability. Uh, Bristol, the city of, is in the top 10 areas of the cities that we look at for unaffordability rather than affordability. So it's a problem and a challenge, and it has effects not just on housing, but actually the ability of people to come and take up economic opportunities that are in the patch. Stephen Williams, you just talked about it. Just come to you, say a little bit more about, you know, you talked a little bit about what you would do in relation to the green belt, but more generally about dealing with this affordability challenge. What would you be doing? Yeah, when I, when I was a minister in the Department of Housing uh, and Local Government, we had maps on our office walls which showed sort of hotspots in the country for affordability. And uh, it was Cambridge, Oxford, and Bristol and Bath were, were the sort of highest shades of red in, in the country. And I think it's now 13 times your income in order to buy a property in the region. But of course, there are a lot of young people who are coming to the region to start their first job while graduating uh, from our universities and staying, which is what uh, led me to settle down here. Uh, renting in the private sector is astronomically expensive in West Bristol and Bath as well. So we've got to look at both of those sectors. And the, the quick answer is it's simple economics. We, we do have to build many more new homes. So I, I, I've also heard, as Samuel has, the, the pleas from lots of people that, you know, please, please don't build here. And I say to everyone, while we can treat sympathetically with, with building in different places, everywhere does need to build new homes because we have to give hope to local young people. They can carry on living in the Chew Valley. They can carry on living in, in Thornbury or, or Chipping Sodbury. So we do have to build new homes everywhere, but put them in places where they are linked to good local transport and so that we're building sustainable communities. I would also build into the principle of, of the new SDS that we have to craft, that all of our development should be socially balanced as well. If you leave it up to the private sector, they will seek to build uh, large executive homes because that's where most of the profit is. We should build a principle into the SDS that you must build a mixture of one bedroom flat homes, two bedroom houses, as well as the larger homes, you get socially balanced communities. Um, I'd also like to set up a social enterprise to directly build uh, houses for sale, uh, private rental sector as well, and use the surplus from both of those activities to invest in houses for social rent. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. So with high unaffordability, it's you know it's a housing issue, but it's a labour market, it's an economy issue as well. Keeping and attracting talent into the into the area what would you how would you resolve it what would you be doing yeah absolutely and charlie thank you for the question uh, i i firstly I, I lament i think part of what i've heard from uh, both uh, labor and uh, lib dems this morning this this notion of um wealth and compassion or social impact and private sector somehow being mutually exclusive i think nearly all of us on the call here today Business owners, business leaders know that we are committed to delivering social impact, uh, creating jobs, creating wealth, and we don't see them as mutually exclusive. In fact, we know that the private sector are driving away in many social impact and social investments. And so partnership has got to be the starting point, rather than saying we, we've got to set up some barriers between the private sector being able to uh, deliver impact. Instead, let's build closer relationship. Let's build much more uh, active partnerships, uh, investing in the social impact and the social returns that we want to see. So things like city funds that, uh, that I think in, in fairness are doing a great job uh, investing in social impact and building affordable homes. And, uh, and that type of social impact, the social infrastructure bank, uh, set up uh, by uh, Rishi Sunak that will be driving forward. This type of approach is absolutely right. Leveraging private capital to deliver social return. Secondly, uh, we, we need to get on top of uh, too many large organizations 
holding uh, uh, land uh, and not developing uh, in a timely manner. That is that skewing the market. We need homes now. We need to start building. And um, lastly, I'm very keen on partnering further with people uh, like the Housing Festival, who uh, and Jez, uh, what he's doing there, and the team looking at modern methods of construction, innovative, uh, cheaper to build, really affordable to build, that can get people on the ladder uh, of homes that, whether it's for young professionals or families, there's some really exciting stuff happening in this area. And, and I hope to drive it forward in a partnership approach, unlocking investment, yes, from government, uh, yes, through developing a spatial development strategy so we know where homes need to go across the region, but also working closely with the private sector, attracting that inward investment, both domestically and from overseas. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerome, what are you going to do to uh, address this unaffordability issue, which, as we've said, is a housing issue, but it's a labour market. It's, a, it's an economy issue as well. I mean, I think before repeating, I, mean, I think the can, this, you're hearing quite similar things from the different candidates at the moment. So I'm going to say something a little bit about what I will be asking government for, because what's happened with housing over, the, over my adult lifetime is that rising house prices have become a sort of national religion. Um, and we've ended up with a highly undesirable situation where the younger generation is being almost completely locked out of a place to call home. And we've got people in their, you know, 30s and 40s who are in permanent short term rental accommodation, which is not it's just not a foundation of a civilised society. Mm -hmm. uh, and that policy shift has to take place nationally. Uh, and the way that stamp duty is working is that people um, who are in, you know, people, People in there who retired, who want to downsize, really don't want to because actually the, the tax treatment is, is so expensive. So there's some essential national changes that, that, that I would be calling for. And the other aspect is, I mean, I think Stephen touched on it, is that we're not getting volume house builders to provide what the, the kind of homes that we actually need as a society. And whether it's through the planning and the spatial development strategy, that we're insisting on smaller places which which people could downsize to and a more 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 balanced communities or whether it is through empowering community land and community building organizations who who are far more likely in the kind of homes that they're building to come up with properties that reflect our needs as a as a modern society okay very good dan uh, your view on that well, I'm similar to the Green candidate in that many of the things that have been said, I think um, I don't need to go over again. But the real issue is that we have a broken uh, market in terms of housing. Uh, what we need to do, because the largest component really of housing is the cost of land, is somehow change that and, and make that different to make houses relatively more affordable. Uh, and that seems to me, it's interesting when you look at the housing targets that governments have set since the last war, the Second World War, uh, I think they've only ever been met nationally twice. And that was when there were huge initiatives for council house building or other forms of owner, uh, building outside of the private sector. Now, the private sector does a really good job in as far as it goes, but it is clearly going to be motivated by what profit it can make. That's completely understandable. Um, although I do think compassion uh, is a, an important factor there because it doesn't seem compassionate to always pursue the most money when it comes to house building. It seems to meet need is, is also an important thing there. Uh, so what I would want to do is do the kind of things that I did when I was um, the Rural Affairs Minister, is look at new ways of getting land. Now, for example, there is a lot of Duchy of Cornwall land uh, in the Bath and North East Somerset area in particular. I would like to work a, a relationship with them to see how we can use some of that land in an environmentally friendly way, because I think what's key here is it isn't any housing at any cost. It does have to meet environmental standards. And I'd like to see variety of housing. I don't like it when estates are very similar and the housing is all the same. Uh, I think if we're going to <coughs> attract the people that the questioner wants to come and work and, and live in our area, then I think it's really, really important that if we can't deal with affordability quickly, which is very likely because we're talking about a huge market, a huge change that would be needed, 
we should make those homes as attractive as possible by trying to make them a bit different and a bit more unique. Look at some of the very beautiful housing in and around Bath or Bristol or some of our market towns over the years. Some of that is lovely because it's unique and different. You walk down the street, but each house is slightly different. Everyone feels they have a uniqueness about living in that community. So we need to do some simple things like that to have better design. And the big thing I'd say is we need to look ahead. The Metro Mayor's job is to look ahead, horizon scan and work out what's likely to be coming down the tracks. Very hard job, I accept. But what we do know, for example, is that we've got an, a rapidly aging population. We know that in about 20 to 30 years, about 10 percent of us will directly or indi indirectly be affected by or you know, impacted by dementia. So what we need is any new homes, I would argue, that come in, there should be a real push to make those what are called flexible homes, flexible design, so that you can change the layout of homes so that you know, if you're younger and you've got children and you want bedrooms at that stage in your life, you can have that. Then yeah. as you get perhaps older, you want to work from home. And I think we do need to do a lot more of that and that will help in lots of ways. Uh, you can change and have an office uh, perhaps on the ground floor if that's what you want. Or if you have unfortunate health issues or just getting older, you may want to have a, a walking shower on the ground floor, who knows? But you've got that flexibility to do it so that homes aren't fixed, they can be adjusted, which I think will make them more attractive uh, and answer uh, some of the questions raised by Charlie. Very good. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, let's uh, let's move on to uh, transport, um, and we've got a question from Sally Barrow. Sally, you're on the call. I'm led to believe. So if you can unmute and ask your question, that would be great. Right. Hello. Thank you. Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. What would you do to integrate public transport across the west of England? Very good. Good, straightforward uh, question. Uh, Jerome, let's start with you. What would you do to integrate public transport across west of England? I think that there's, there is quite a lot of good work that is taking place around integrated ticketing at the moment, which simply needs to be built on so that um, if you're getting a, a sort of ticket from um, Bath to Clevedon, that you will be able to get a get a train to Temple Meads, get a get a bus ticket to to Clevedon, and it would be on the on the same fare. Um, and similarly, we need to be able to have. It's essential that we've got tickets that work across different bus operators as well. The other aspect that is being worked on to some extent, but which is a sort of more of a marketing challenge, is that actually there are quite a lot of sort of discounted region wide tickets that people don't know about or the bus bus driver won't tell you about. And there needs to be much clearer communication around existing ticketing offers so that people realise the, the, the that public transport can be can be more affordable. Similarly, we've got um, season tickets, um, which are very good, but for part time workers, and as we shift towards a more flexible, flexible working home economy, being able to get discounted tickets, um, not to, to some extent as a part time worker will be really helpful. And that also works for, uh, you know, that's particularly true for, for, for women as, as well, who, you know, who are much more likely to be working part, part time than men. We, we need to address the issue of access on our public transport um, to make sure that, you know, wheelchairs and buggies are able to get on there because so many people locally aren't able easily to use public transport. And in terms of the bigger picture, of course, we need that, that long term investment, Sally, in trains and potentially trams that just expand the reach of good public transport and added to that the frequency of services and the opening of new stations which i'm sure other candidates will talk about as well okay very good thank you very much dan so what would you do to integrate the public transport system so jerome's talked a little bit about the desperate nature of it you will have some powers available to you to do something about that if you so choose to take them up what are you going to do well look Rather than go through all the advantages that um, the Green Canada has rightly pointed to and the things we need, what, what I'd say is my aim would be to have a, the kind of public transport system that Londoners enjoy. So that's our objective, so that people there no more think of driving a car, particularly in central London, than flying. They know that the buses will turn up on time or the tubes will turn up on time. 
They know they'll be reliable. They can plan their journeys, their life, their work, their skills, their training based on knowing it will be reliable. But what I would just add in addition to the list that the Green Canada put forward is safety is a huge issue. Uh, we don't want people stuck on bus stops in the middle of the night, not able to know that the transport is coming. Uh, and we want really good information, uh, much better information than we currently enjoy uh, at train stations, at bus stops, et cetera, so that you can make plans or make alternatives if there is a delay or something's broken down or whatever. So I think that is really, really, really important. Um, I don't want to be a Metro mayor who has all these new ideas uh, that suddenly has a great brainwave and wants to brag about it or whatever. I want to be one that looks at what works in other places and bring it to our region. So what I would be doing is looking at where they've invented the wheel and that wheel is really working uh, and really making the difference. Um, I'm, I'm hugely haunted by the fiasco uh, and the awful situation that happened uh, under the last Labour government where about a billion pounds in today's money terms was uh, allocated for Bristol and South Gloucestershire to get a tram system put together. Because they couldn't find agreement, uh, we lost that. That went to Nottingham and Nottingham now enjoys a very good public transport system. Uh, we should never have fallen uh, into that trap. We should never have not allowed that to go somewhere else. Uh, and that's what I'm determined to do. So I will grab whatever money I can. I will make sure that we don't do that again. That was terrible. Uh, I will ask government for money by making a strong case for our needs and saying that it's not just an investment in us, it's an investment in, in Great Britain PLC because we're very productive and we create a lot of wealth in our region and the potential for us to do even more wealth creation is enhanced by a really good public transport system that is integrated and joined up in the way that the questioner suggests. Very good. Okay. Stephen, I think you mentioned something specifically in your opening comments on these sorts of issues, but what would you do to integrate public transport across the West of England area? Well, ultimately, I'd like uh, an integrated transport authority and I would ask for the power to introduce that. That's probably a medium term um, power to implement because we've got some first steps in order to get to that stage, um, which would include franchising our bus services, a power that's been available since 2017 that the current Conservative regional mayor has, has declined to take up. Um, I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, I'm really glad that Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester is now going down that path. I don't think we can look to London uh, as, as a model where they already have a, a similar system. And effectively, they do have an integrated transport system through TfL. We, we're not, we're not you know, an 8 million population capital city bigger than most European Union member states. Um, but I think we can aspire to be at least something like the other nearby capital city in Cardiff, which is a far better public transport system than us. So first of all, let's get bus franchising, a system that works for us in the peculiarities of our region in place, taking control of the routes, uh, capping the fares, planning, planning new orbital routes around both cities and setting some quality standards for the bus fleet itself as well. The second step we'd have to have before getting an ITA in this region is actually completing our regional jigsaw. North Somerset has been a leap which has been mentioned uh, already is outside our region. I think that's a a political mistake that various people have made uh, over the years. The authority there now wants to join the authority. I've made that clear for the last two years that they want to join the authority. They've been obstructed by the mayor, the Labour mayor of Bristol. Uh, if I'm elected, I will immediately start bringing people together to get over this, to get over the past and bring North Somerset in so that we have a complete travel to work area, complete transport. Uh, region. Western Supermare is about to become bigger than Bath. So we talk about two cities in our region at the moment. We have to think about Western Supermare too. But I'd also repurpose some of our existing transport hubs. So our park and ride sites around both, both of our cities. I would switch them over to being multimodal transport centres where you can choose how you arrive there, indeed how you leave there as well. It doesn't have to be arrived by car and leave by bus. You could arrive by bike and leave by bus but you've got to repurpose the site so people can securely leave uh, their, their own bike there, or they can hire an electric bike or a scooter to complete their journey into the city. So I'd repurpose our park and ride sites and also our multi-story car parks in Bristol as well. They're practically empty at the moment because not so many people are going into the city centers. This is an opportunity to repurpose probably a floor in each car park to set them aside for bicycles so people can park their bike in the dry 
in secure conditions and then when they come back from work or they come back from shopping it's still there i think we have to rethink a lot of a lot of the ways we travel into both our cities okay very good and samuel what would you do to better integrate the public transport system across the west of england yeah well thank you sally for this question and you're you're absolutely right that integration piece is is what's absolutely key in uh, my view uh, to delivering the transport system that we need. And I, I said in my opening statements that now is the time uh, not to risk our recovery, but seize opportunity and not undo the work that has been done under a conservative leadership on, on, under Tim Bowles. So we do now have a, a joint local transport plan. We do have the local cycling walking plan. We do have regional mass transit uh, work that's underway and investment in that. We do have a 10 year uh, rail delivery strategy and we, we did win over 30 million to be one of the future transport zones. All about uh, innovating, identifying and delivering a integrated transport system that works. So what are the, the three key themes that I think we need to look at? I think we need to, to integrate as the question uh, related to uh, Sally. And for that, there are a couple of things that I would look to uh, implement very quickly using uh, some of that 30 million for future transport zone uh, money to start delivering straight away. And so with the use of, a, of an app type thing or, uh, or, or, or a Oyster card equivalent card, so that we have a single mode of accessing across the different modes of, of transport. Um, unlike uh, my Lib Dem counterpart, I, uh, I wouldn't look towards franchising. Why? Because I don't think we need to be driving towards ownership as the combined authority. We need to be driving towards partnership. And that's why I would look to develop enhanced partnerships so that we can deliver the impact that I, I think, Sally, you're probably talking about, which is transport that is on time, that is affordable, that is inclusive, uh, that is safe, as, as uh, Mr. Norris raised earlier. Uh, that's what we need to be looking towards. We need to expand some things, of course, absolutely. Things like our cycle, uh, our walking and wheeling network is uh, lacked integration. One second you're, you're riding along a, a nice path, the next second you have to bump onto the road, the next second you're you're get, almost getting knocked off as, as I have done on occasion uh, whilst riding through Bristol. So we need to integrate that. And cycling, walking and wheeling infrastructure plan commits, uh, I think it's 400 million uh, in ambition for this project. And those are the figures we need to be looking at. Uh, and I'll be working with government to unlock that. And lastly, we need to innovate. Uh, and, and there's a lot of innovations that we can look towards, particularly when we start to think about rural to urban travel. I'm inspired by what we're seeing in Japan and Germany around autonomous travel, which might sound high in the sky, but the, in, the innovations are there and uh, the integrations of that is, is showing actually not only delivering a service, but delivering profit as well, which is something that obviously is absolutely needed. We need them to be affordable services. So there's some things, innovation, integration and expansion. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Good, good responses. Um, as the chair, I have to bite my fingers not to kind of dive in and offer my own to kind of thoughts, particularly as buses is one of the particular things that I spend a lot of time talking about. But I will resist the urge to, to get involved. I am not a candidate, obviously. So uh, it's no good you listening to what, to me. But but nevertheless, let, let's pick up, I think, a slightly different aspect of the transport question uh, on the issue. And it's from Anne O'Driscoll. So Anne, you're on the call. Unmute. And I think it, it slightly twists the question in an interesting way and makes some difficult choices for our mayors, I would suggest, if I read the rightly what you're suggesting. Uh, Anne, away you thank, go. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to know how um, the mayoral candidates will reduce the number of vehicle miles being driven annually in our region to ensure that we can meet our climate emergency targets and our net zero carbon aspirations. Very good. So this is a sort of twist a little bit on the on the first question. Uh, Anne is asking particularly about driven. So she's making a specific point about that. I would suggest that she's encouraging you to think about your sticks that may be available as well as your carrots uh, in encouraging behaviour change, as you would want to see it as well. But maybe I'm doing a bit too much for Anne uh, in that kind of space. So uh, let's go to um, Stephen. 
let's hear from you first. What would you do to reduce the number of vehicle miles driven annually in the region? Yeah, we, uh, thanks, Anne. Great question. Um, we do have to reduce the impact of the private motor vehicle on both our cities and to some extent on, on, on the countryside as well. And that, that will require some tough choices. Um, but that's the advantage of having a regional mayor. So you can stand slightly above uh, and away from local councillors who are often under enormous pressure whenever a change is proposed that restricts people to drive where they like, park where they like. And having been a councillor in the city centre of Bristol when we first started talking about residence parking schemes in the 1990s, I've still got some of the scars uh, from that. But we do need to reduce the impact of, of the private motor vehicle on, on both our cities. As a first step, I, I, I would um, work with um, car, car companies to, to set up uh, a space in each residential street in Bristol and Bath, the larger residential streets, a set aside space for a community electric car club in every single street and in the villages around both cities would, would set up a, an electric car club uh, in those villages as well, in the parish hall car park or wherever it might be, so that people can start to think they can still have access to a high quality vehicle, a vehicle that doesn't pollute, in order to make those occasional journeys to the shop, the hospital, uh, whatever it might be, and then start to think that they don't need that second vehicle or even that third vehicle that a lot of people uh, have in the more prosperous parts of, of Bristol and Bath because they have access to a community vehicle and gradually reduce the number of vehicles that are competing for space on our residential streets and then are competing for space uh, to, to, to get to the city centres as well. And it, 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 it's no good thinking that all of our prayers will be answered as we transition away from petrol and diesel onto electric or onto autonomous vehicles that Samuel uh, just mentioned as well. If we still have the same number of cars, we've got to talk about cleaner driving, but also fewer vehicles as well. Very good. Thank you very much. And these Stephen Samuel, what are you doing to reduce the number of vehicle miles driven on an annual basis? Yeah, thank you. I, I think firstly, um, it's it's right that we need to reduce the vehicle miles. Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt about it, uh, both from a uh, congestion point of view, uh, from a, uh, a pollutant point of view, I'm talking about particulate matter, rubber on road, uh, and, and exhaust fumes, and, and then of course uh, climate anthropogenic VHGs and those, those climate issues. It, hu a huge issue that we need to combat. But it's also right to to note that I think it's something like uh, urban vehicles sit still about 97% of the time. Most of the time, vehicles are sitting in our drive. Uh, and so, how do we ensure that, for in fact, all of those local uh, short journeys uh, people can do uh, around urban areas it, by leaving their car at the time. For those short journeys, they should be able to sit there 100% of the time. So that's looking at the, the integration of the transport, public transport system that I mentioned in the previous question. But particularly looking at uh, Stephen Williams is, is right around, around car clubs. That's something we can absolutely expand and invest more in, greater partnerships there. But also, uh, continue uh, rolling out things like the e-scooters, which I think have been a tremendous success, notwithstanding the issues of excess on pavements and the like, work needs to be done there. And also electrified uh, docked uh, bike systems is something I'm very keen on introducing, uh, using that future transport zone money to do so, so that urban travel can, step, you can stay at home, leave your cars at home. That's a bit more, maybe that's a bit of the carrot. A, a, a bit of the stick you mentioned, uh, well, actually, I think, Clean air zones and the introduction of clean air zones is a, is a good thing. Um, and uh, that, that means that, well, actually, if you think you're going to have to pay nine pounds or whatever it might be, uh, and you could walk or you could jump on a bus, you are more likely to do that. But I'd be lobbying government as well to, uh, to change the Transport Act to an extent so that uh, the authority can take some profits and redirect those profits into the development of mobility credit so that uh, people can then jump on that shared transport. They can use it, whether it's for, as part of a car club, whether it's on the e-scooter, so that actually, uh, in a sense, Andrew, the, the stick becomes a carrot uh, as well. And I think that's- The uh, big carrot stick. It's a long stick that's made out of carrot. 
Very good. <laughs> All right, Dan, what would you be doing to to reduce the the miles driven on an annual basis? Well, it comes it comes back to my previous answer, I guess, is we've got to make it easy for people or easier for people to make the right decisions. Um, and now I've talked to Anne to some extent uh, about this already, and I've spoken to her over the, over many decades. I think we've been speaking at one way or another. Um, and what's very clear to me is we need some quick gains, quick returns in order to take the public with us on this. So what I'd like to see is much more space for people to cycle, much more space for people to walk so that they can make part of their regular behavior, their commuting behavior, that's part of it. So that they don't think they're gonna drive always or, or whatever, they do other things as well. Uh, and if you think about it, that makes complete sense from our health point of view. We have, you know, there's a whole huge business in losing weight and all the rest of it. Actually, if we just got more active uh, and combined it with everyday activities that we have to undertake, we could sort that out as well. Uh, so that's quite important. Um, I suppose the other thing is that we need to be thinking about how often we really need to make journeys. Um, you know, if we can get really good rollout on broadband everywhere across the West of England, that's high quality, high speed and affordable, because it's often available, but quite expensive, that could mean people, many more people could work from home for part of the week. And that would immediately reduce by whatever percentage it would be the number of car journeys. So we have to use technology to kind of get rid of that demand, if you like, and perhaps have flexible hours uh, when we start and finish work. If we can get employers and people uh, uh, watching today to think about when does staff have to be there and when do they need to leave, uh, that would help too, because it would reduce the peak. It would even out the flows of traffic. Uh, so that would reduce the amount of pollution for any given car miles. It doesn't reduce the car miles necessarily, but it does uh, to stop them being so polluting. Um, and I suppose the other thing I'd say is that we need to um, kind of have more information. What I think is there's a lot of people who genuinely want to do the right thing. But I think finding out what the right thing to do is quite hard. And I think the Metro Mayor has a role to lead. And if you, you know, um, Stephen might not be so keen on the London transport system. I think it's got great advantages. It isn't the same as our region. Of course, we don't copy all the things that wouldn't apply to us. You know, um, we certainly not have buses that had windows that you couldn't open in the summer. We would want to avoid that any price because London transport is terrible in that way. But we want to look at the good things that London does and say, yeah, let's have some of that. And if, if you have to look at Nottingham or other places, let's do that too. Um, and one of the things that I notice when I'm on uh, the London transport is I keep seeing Sadiq Khan telling me what I need to be doing or how I can get more information. Now, you know, if it ends up being me or any some of the others, we may not, we may be fed up of seeing those faces, but at least that information is getting out about how you can learn what is an improvement, how you can, you know, get involved in doing the right thing. Because I think it's an idea that time has come. The public really do want to make the changes. Uh, it hasn't been so for a number of years because, you know, I confess I'm, I love being in my car. It's a very comfortable environment. But do you know what? I've got to change my behavior and I will do that if there are better options. Okay. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to create those better options and do some of the things that I've just mentioned. Very good. OK, thank you. Uh, Jerome, your reflection on that. What would you be doing to reduce the big? I'll just click, uh, come off on mute. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Anne. This is definitely an elephant in the room um, that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, and I think we we also hear the kind of the timid approach from, I mean, in particular, the, the Lib Dems and the Labour candidates um, who are worried about fright, frightening the voters. Um, and so we've heard we've heard about the carrots, but we do need to think about what the sticks might be. And if we look at things nationally, we know that uh, road pricing is coming. The, the, the shift to electric vehicles is wipe, will wipe out the revenue from vehicle ex, excise duty to the tune of about 40 billion a year. And this is an area where we can lead as a region because we should start from the point of where are we getting congestion? What's it costing us? And how can we better balance between our, our, you know, how do we get the most efficient use of vehicles? In Bristol City Council, I proposed a congestion charge in, in the, the, the budget last year, um, which was rejected by Labour, put forward a workplace parking levy this year, which was again rejected by Labour. They, we've got to see that shift at regional level. And I do think that the government will be keen to support a Metro Mayor who is showing that commitment. That, and starting with some very specific examples, if you take Cleveland Bridge in Bath, um, it's pretty much, it's a heritage bridge 
and it's being used by thousands of vehicles every day and HGVs that are destroying that bridge. Picking some pinch points, which would be suitable for congestion charging, would be a really important way to start. And I think people will see the benefits, well, you know, whether it's Brislington or the North Bristol Fringe. Um, congestion means that the economy is grinding to a halt. And I think even with the wishful thinking that we're seeing about what happens as people work more from home, there's going to be some, there's going to need to be some more bold action. OK, very good. So um, thank you for, for that. Um, I, I would just sort of say that London and Nottingham, both mentioned by different candidates, have a mix of uh, carrots and sticks in their transport system, as you well know, or if you don't, you should have a look at that. So they are providing better alternatives, but they're also making it marginally more difficult to drive your car um, uh, in different ways, which I think is kind of interesting. I'll say no more than that. Um, one of the other areas that the mayor will have a, a, a reasonable amount of responsibility uh, over is skills. So I want to just pick up on a, on a skills question that was submitted to us. I don't think she's on the call, and it was from Sauda Kayalambuka. Uh, I don't think Sauda is on the call, but her question was, and actually it relates to obviously what we've all experienced over the last 12 months, uh, a bit longer, is uh, the pandemic and the lockdown. And her, her question is, what opportunities will you pursue for young people to gain skills, training and jobs post pandemic? And we obviously particularly know that during the pandemic and obviously the lockdown, uh, it's our young people that have been disproportionately affected by the lockdown, in part because they work in industries and sectors that are essentially massively affected through the through the lockdown. You can see that disproportionate in some of the entertainment and urban services uh, services economy more more generally. So what would you be doing in order to help our young people uh, come back into or to to develop new skills? Uh, Jerome, and this is an area you will have responsibility uh, for some of that. So what would you be doing? Um. I think working with the with some of the opportunities that are there at the moment is really important. And, and again, in the overall, in that sh context of a shift towards a low carbon economy, um, one of the first areas. I mean, speaking as one of the candidates who, you know, as one of the only candidate who's created significant numbers of jobs, I do have kind of direct experience of of what's required here. Uh, apprenticeships are a really important area. They're a great um, means of um, giving people skills, um, developing our employers as well as our employees so that they know how to, to look after young people coming in into the workforce. And although the Metro Mayor doesn't have direct responsibility for, for apprenticeships, they've got very important influencing role. And I think that the apprenticeships aren't being taken up enough by the SMEs in our region, and they need support and guidance as to how best to do that. And I'm concerned that there isn't adequate diversity in terms of the people in who are getting apprenticeships. So, so looking at building the offer, making sure that there's, there's diversity that's there. We then have the sort of the skills in our, in our FE colleges, um, the, the skills training that's there, looking at satisfaction levels with our employers as to the, the skills that the, the young people are coming out with is really important. I'm concerned that actually the, 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 there's patchy quality in, in those courses and that with input from the, from the employers and with input from the participants in the courses, we'll get a much better, um, we'll be able to craft those courses much better to meet the needs of a, of a future workforce. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I'm sure there'll be more to say on this. Okay, very good. Dan, similar question to you. How are we how are you going to help the young people uh, in the city region that have been obviously struggling through the through the pandemic and obviously the the lockdown that resulted from it? Yeah, well, the, well, the key to this, again, is information, because uh, what you find if you go on the West of England Combined Authority website is a, a, a huge set of information that's quite complex and hard to navigate. Uh, and what you need if you're a young person, either trying to go into work for the first time, or if you've lost your job, or you need to find some new skills and training because you want to change career, and let's face it, um, what will almost mark uh, the next 100 years will be the fact that we will all have to learn 
different professional roles uh, on many occasions throughout our life because change will be so fast. We'll have to adapt, we'll have to be lifelong learning literally all the time. So what you need is really good quality information so that young people can make really informed choices. And it's interesting because higher education hit this kind of crisis a few years back. Uh, I was involved in writing a document uh, for an organization called the Russell Group uh, called Informed Choices because what it was discovering was that many young people were not making the right A-level choices to then go on and make sensible and, 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 and productive and, and, and good career choices. So that's what we need for uh, people elsewhere, for younger people too. That shouldn't just apply to HE, it should apply to FE and uh, adult learning too. So good quality information. Then what comes from that, if you have that good quality information, is you can see where there are gaps, where courses are not so popular, that they're just being put on because that's what colleges have always done or, or providers have always done, because the future is going to be about green jobs. Uh, and we, you know, we will need to use uh, the new uh, sources of energy that don't damage the planet. We will need to look into geothermal energy uh, and using it in our homes and our businesses in a much greater way than we've done up to now. We do need to have heat pumps and all the rest of it. But You've got to have people who can install those. You've got to have people who can maintain those. Uh, and I think young people have already bought into that. In a sense, they're ahead of the rest of us. I think they kind of get all that and the importance of that, probably because they've got a biggest investment in it, because, you know, obviously we're partway through our lives. Uh, they are going to be the, the biggest uh, impacted by us not get hitting our CO2 target. So I think that probably is, is the, the areas that I want to emphasise. I mean, obviously, I agree with the other candidates, and we'll all probably agree on all sorts of issues here, because the role of the mayor kind of narrows what you can do and therefore the solutions are all pretty clear I think okay. but what but getting on with that empowering people uh, and the, and I suppose what I want to do and this is partly because I've always worked with young people in previous uh, professional ca uh, careers uh, either in child protection or, or other things is I would like to hear the voices of young people much more than they are currently heard now so I want to set up some kind of panel to allow young people to set that agenda because it shouldn't just be about us saying well that this is how it's going to be they should be saying this is what we need these are the skills we need these are the areas of training that are important to us and that will evolve because it you know change by definition means that we have to be flexible all the time and keep listening very good okay thank you very much for that samuel uh what would you be doing to support the young people that have been affected may have dropped out of the labor market lost their job uncertain how do you how do you help them uh find opportunities develop new skills what would you be doing as the mayor yeah thank you andrew and and here uh dan Morris and i are absolutely in agreement that we need to, yes, thumbs up from Dan. You know, we, we, we absolutely do need to be consulting, engaging in conversation with our young people, uh, not in a tick box exercise, but in an authentic understanding of where, where they want to develop. And I think we think a lot about uh, employment, uh, but actually as a region, we have a fantastic group of uh, a real culture of young entrepreneurship. I, I don't know if Ash Phillips is on, or is on the call, actually. He may or may not be. But um, if, for those of you who know, who know Ash, he's changed now uh, to, I think it's called Different. But for a long time, he founded and ran the uh, Young Entrepreneurs Network Association, supporting young entrepreneurs to scale and grow businesses. And this is a really exciting thing that we should be, that is a jewel in our crown, that we should absolutely be supporting. And so I'd be looking to, uh, to implement uh, greater funding, greater support for the work of the Growth Hub uh, that is supporting businesses to scale and grow. And I'd be looking also to how we can release more uh, seed and scale up funding for young entrepreneurs. I think that's really, really important. Uh, we've heard about apprenticeships. Absolutely right. We've heard about uh, new employment opportunities. Absolutely right. And we, we need to launch more collaboration. I've spoken about it already, the Collaborative Future Skills Forum, so that we can bring together uh, employers and apprenticeship providers alongside education providers and those who are wanting to enter the workforce so that we know where innovation is going, where the jobs of the future are, where the skills of the future need to be, and, and then we can start putting on the courses that will impact them. Last two very quick points yeah. Um, yeah. is this, because we know that the COVID uh, pandemic has disproportionately impacted, say, under the 20, under 25s, but also uh, those from minority ethnic backgrounds. And we need to have an inclusive recovery. And, and this is something we should be really speaking about a lot more, I think. How do we make sure we have an inclusive economy? And there are lots of things that I think we can do. 
And there's lots of learning that I still need to take in this area. But one thing that I'm very keen on introducing is uh, community ambassadors. So that actually as a, com as a combined authority, we can start listening to and engaging with a whole variety of communities, whether it's uh, uh, BAME communities or whether it's young entrepreneurs or whoever it may be, actively engaging, actively listening, and therefore being able to unlock the infrastructure and, uh, and investment that is needed. Okay, very good. Uh, Stephen, supporting the young people that have been affected, what would you be doing? Yeah, this links back, in fact, to all of our previous questions, because I, I would say the skills budget is probably the most important lever of power that the Metro Mayor actually has, and it's the one that's very little talked about. Uh, by, by, by journalists or, or commentators, but it is an area where you can make a direct impact on individuals' lives. The, the pandemic hasn't affected everyone evenly, as, we, as we've been acknowledging. It's not just young people. I think it's disproportionately uh, female young people, and, and as Samuel just said, uh, people from black and minority ethnic communities as well, who disproportionately work in hospitality and retail in, in our two city centres. So we do need to help those to bounce back quickly, but some of those jobs aren't going to come back. You know, Debenhams, the biggest, biggest shop in Broadmead, isn't coming back. Something else, though, probably will go into that, into that Debenhams site. So I would bring together all of our, first of all, our colleges, uh, four FE colleges in the area, including Western Supermare, because people do travel out there for certain courses, to make sure that we're initially retraining people if necessary for the quick recovery from the effects of the pandemic, but also are we really training people for that green future that we want to hit by 2030? The last time I visited uh, an FE college, and I used to do this a lot uh, as, as, as an MP, uh, they were still training people on how to lay bricks and, and mortar rather than modern methods of construction. And so if we're going to build those houses more quickly and build more of them in the future, we have to shift the way that we construct a lot of our housing sites as well, away from the traditional way of building housing estates where it can take six months from preparing the site to handing over, handing over the keys, where it could be six weeks uh, if you use offsite construction uh, and, and then on-site uh, assembly. But you need to reskill the entire workforce uh, throughout the housing industry in order to get that right. And it's not only important that we do that in order to build at a scale and at a speed that we need to, but also you get the quality consistent as well. Um, you're much more likely to get um, the, the tough environmental standards I'd like to see on our housing stock from the zero carbon homes uh, legislation I brought in in 2015. If if you have common methods of construction uh, with with um, with um, modular sites supplying the materials, so I think we need to look right across our skills provision to make sure we're helping people to recover in the short term. But are we skilling people for those exciting green jobs of the future that that, that we desperately need to get to before 2030? Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, thank you for your thoughts on, on that. We're in the last leg, um, and I want to get through at, uh, at least two more questions, if I can, and give you each a chance to, to make your closing pitches. Uh, I think we can do it in the time that we've got. So, talked on this in, in many ways, this next question, but um, just want to get some practicalities about how you would do it. Ben Lowndes. Ben, are you, you're on the call. I can see you on my screen. You've got a question about collaboration at the West of England scale. So Ben, unmute and um, and ask your question, Ben. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. We can hear you perfectly. Good, I can see some noddies there, that's good. Um, so uh, I, uh, firstly, I, I agree with the, um, uh, the points made about the importance of having a, 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 you know strong leadership in the region. Yep. My question's a bit closer to home, really. It's, it's that, you know, I, I, our region faces a collaboration challenge, which uh, has has held us back over the years. I think, and and you know, we've seen that most recently in in, in spatial planning, Freeport as well, um, bringing local leaders together and corralling different parties together under a regional banner has been difficult. But it's crucial for us that we start we start to do this better. So my question to the panel is. Uh, what would you do to start to address this and bring the region together to make a difference? Thanks, Ben. Great question. So, again, let's assume that you all agree that collaboration is good and we all want it. 
So the question then becomes, what would you be practically doing to try and bring this um, to the fore? Samuel. Samuel? Sorry. It took yeah. a second to unmute. No, no, uh, sorry, go on. Great. Uh, thank, thank you, Ben. Uh, you're right. And, the, and you will have heard me talk about collaboration a lot today, whether it's the introduction of new collaborative forums, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a relational approach to to how we we work, whether it's new partnerships uh, for transport, collaboration really sits at the heart of of what I do day to day. Uh, that's in uh, whether it's in business, whether it's international development, whether it's in uh, campaigning and lobbying. Because I recognise that working together is what unlocks the innovations that we need, the the driving forward of uh, the solutions. And so I would start with relationship. And I hope that doesn't sound too, um, uh, too informal in a sense, because my recognition, uh, recognition and my uh, experience is that actually a lot of this is about relationship. Uh, and so bringing together the leaders from across the region, uh, whether that's business leaders, uh, public leaders, uh, community leaders, so that we have that relationship and we are in communication. It's really, really key and something that can happen to a greater extent. And secondly, for me, it's about having a real clear vision for why the combined authority exists, that it's about delivering these big strategic uh, infrastructure, uh, economic growth, skills agenda, rather than maybe some of the small, more local uh, plans and projects, although, you know, of course, they're, they're valuable. Actually, the real strength of the combined authority is in its, in, in its bringing together uh, power uh, of creating opportunities to come together and, uh, and, and engage. And so I, I've mentioned already, I would very actively uh, look to uh, get more involved and take more uh, ownership of the Western Gateway. Uh, I'd be working very closely with, with membership groups and, and uh, various other organizations like Business West so that there is a clear understanding of vision as to why we exist, what we're here to do, an understanding of what outcomes we want to see and, uh, and ensuring that it's built on open, honest relationship that can challenge and inspire the change that we want. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Stephen, collaboration is good. You want to achieve it. How would you do it? Well, first of all, um, as an individual, I'm, I'm not a tribalist, also I'm a, a liberal, I'm a liberal, liberal democrat politician, but throughout my, my political journey, which started you know, very young in my early 20s as, a, as the youngest councillor in the region, I've always worked with people from other political parties, and I've often enjoyed working with people from other political parties in order to get things done, whether it's as, as a councillor or later on uh, as a member of parliament, as chair of some committees in parliament, and then as a minister, of course, painful as the outcome was for me personally, uh, working in the coalition government as well in order to do what we thought was right uh, at the time. Um, so I've always been a, a collaborator, a person who enjoys working with others. We've had a lot of questions in these hustings, not just this one about what would be your first act, what would be your first decision. And I think we've all answered that in what would be, you know, what would be a noticeable public decision. Actually, the first thing I think I would do would be a private thing. We're, we're going through the pain of an election, particularly in Bristol, where we were marched up to the top of the hill in March 2020, and then the election didn't happen, and we're now we're having it again for the for the mayor and councillors in Bristol. I would get together privately the three leaders of the councils uh, in that make up the combined authority and the leader of North Somerset as well. There'll be a, could be a new mayor of Bristol, who knows? There is going to be a new leader of Bath and North East Somerset Council because my Lib Dem colleagues there uh, are having a change of leader. So Kevin Guy will be the new person at the table, whatever happens uh, after these elections. So to bring together Kevin, Marvin, if it's still Marvin or whoever it might be, uh, Toby Savage from South Gloucestershire and Don, Don from North Somerset and sit down uh, and re-establish uh, those, those bridges that have been blown up to some extent uh, o o over the years and agree how we can work together. But the local council leaders are not the only local leaders that we have. Um, Dan and I have both been local members of parliament. I often felt that the councils and the MPs didn't work together as closely as they could have 
on, on behalf of the whole region. So I would see our nine members of parliament within the region and the two from North Somerset, all of whom I know personally, some of whom I know incredibly well over a long period of time. I would work with them yep. to help me make the case for all that inward investment, all those new powers that we want devolved from Westminster as well. Use all of the political relationships uh, that we have in order to use them for the best advantage of our region. I think a successful regional mayor is a collaborator, but they're also a diplomat too. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Dan, so collaboration you want to achieve, what would you actually be doing in order to make it happen? Look, Ben, I'm, I'm not going to evade your question, but what I'm going to say to you is all the things that have been said are, I think, self-evident truths. You have to speak to people, you have to meet and try and get on with them and what have you. But the bottom line is, at the end of the day, uh, and we know this, unfortunately, because we've had an invisible mayor and in consequence, and this is the important thing, our region has been invisible and therefore we have not been able to get the traction we need out there in the rest of the country and globally. Uh, what we need is leadership. Now, you will have your own view of what leadership is, and other people will have their views. Uh, we all know it when we see it, but it's really hard to know and say what it is exactly. Uh, it's a bit like when John Lennon was asked, you know, why were the Beatles so successful? And he said if he knew the answer, he would become a manager and manage other bands. Uh, you know, it's that sort of thing. So what I think it is about, though, is being able to say no, because that is an important part of the job. You can't say yes to everything, and politicians get themselves in a pickle because they think they're going to lose popularity by saying no. And that, you know, that is true sometimes, but it's how you say no and how you explain the reasoning for why you say no, so that the people you need to keep working with don't feel that they've somehow been, you know, ignored or their argument hasn't been strong. You just got to, you've got to be honest, basically. It's about being fundamentally very honest. Okay. Also, because I'm slightly older, I think, than the rest of these guys, I'm at a stage in my life where I don't care if people like me anymore. And some of you will understand that. Uh, so I think that's very liberating because what it means is that I want to do what I think is the right decision. And I've had a, a bit of an independent streak all my life. Um, so I haven't always okay. been completely on side with my party. And I've been prepared to explain why, because I have principled views about all sorts of things. And in fairness to Stephen Williams, Stephen has done that on occasion against his party as well. He's, he's stood up for things that he's believed in. Uh, so I think those are the key things. And in the end, this is where you all come in and the voters come in. You have to decide who is it is going to most effectively put us back on the national map and on the global map. Who is going to be really good at using the media effectively? Who's going to be clear at communicating the things that we need and why we're so wonderful, our great history and why our future could be even better? So it's your decision. And that's guess I guess that's why you're having these hustings, because you want okay, to make that judgment. Good. Thank you very much for that, Dan. And Jerome. Your, your, your thoughts on this? I would start with what Samuel said, actually, which is having a clear vision and a clear sense of direction. Um, as somebody whose most recent role in business as being sort of chair of chair of the board, um, this is quite a, the, the Metro Mayor is quite a chair of the board sort of role. It's a sort of setting the direction motivating people to to achieve and, and work in work in that direction and then looking at how you're doing against the the direction that, that that's been established yeah. so it's, there are self-evident truths about liaising with people and about liaising with with government and, and and building those good relationships what i think we also have to recognize is and it's something that we've seen in in sort of the interviews about the metro mayor role that have been taking place over the last few weeks is that lots of people don't know what the role is and feel a bit alienated from our political processes okay. um one of the ways to counter that is something that my green councillor colleague paul o'rourke in in bristol has initiated which which was a citizens assembly and i think that Developing a citizens assembly for the West of England will be of particular value because it's got such different component parts and so many different kinds of uh, amazing people here. Um, and what we what what we found with the, the Bristol citizens assembly is that people um, when a genuine representative sample of people are taken and worked with they come up with the radical solutions themselves. And, and we know that with the low carbon, getting to zero carbon by 2030 will take more than politicians just, just saying, this is where we want to be going. It's about the whole po population recognizing what needs to happen 
um, coming up with solutions themselves that politicians might not even have thought of. Um, and that's what we've seen in Bristol with the Citizens Assembly saying we want 80% of journeys by 2030 to be public transport by public transport or active travel. And we've seen it in France and with other Citizens Assembly. In France, they've cut short all flights. So yes, getting politicians working together is important, yeah. but let's make sure that we're empowering our communities in the most powerful ways as well. Okay, very good. Um, so it's one a short question, uh, Les. We've had several questions on this. Actually, it's in this sort of collaboration thing and it lends itself to a yes, no, I think. So we can get through it quickly and then get to uh, closing comments. So several questions around this question. Uh, will you give a firm commitment to bring in North Somerset into Weka within your first term of office or your term of office? Uh, Dan, is this is that priority for you in getting them in, getting them involved formally? I knew you were going to come to me first on that. Um, the answer is I have no problem about North Somerset joining, but I just remind people that it was their choice not to come in in the first place. So that, that was their decision. They weren't sort of ejected or anything like that. Uh, I know that the other parties have made great store about Marvin Rees, the uh, mayor of Bristol's position on this, but I actually share his position that, you know, in a business, you don't expand your business without knowing how you can resource that and finance that. And if there's going to be an expansion from the three council areas to four, we do need to have very clear information about what money the government is providing. Okay. Uh, is, is that going to be to the detriment of the existing three council areas or not? That needs to be answered. That's not an unreasonable question. But I have absolutely no, pro no problem whatsoever with North Somerset joining. In fact, I would want to collaborate and have larger regional area if possible. I think, you know, there's population centres in Froome and Wells and what have a, whatever that logically fit in uh, Western Super Mayor has mentioned. So, no problem with that, but it has to be done properly, of course, okay. and financed well, properly. Yep, fair, fair, fair response. Jerome, your, your, is it a priority? Not Obviously, uh, with the caveats that Dan's introduced, but a priority to get them in, formally in? Yes, it's a priority. Very similar perspective to Dan. Okay, very good. Samuel? Uh, it absolutely is a priority, yes. And uh, as I mentioned, I was speaking with the Secretary of State yesterday and devolution absolutely came up and how we get North Somerset. But I don't think that's uh, ambitious enough. It's about introducing Somerset and Gloucestershire into the mix. And I think it's really important just to raise what, uh, what Dan mentioned about uh, Marvin Rees. Well, actually, the devolution deal was agreed with government uh, investment deal was agreed on with government on the basis of North Somerset being part of it. Now, then when North Somerset chose not to be, government said, well, keep the money that was distributed on the basis of four members. So actually, Bristol were never losing out. Uh, they were deciding to make a political point uh, so as not to include North Somerset uh, this time around, which is a great shame because it has held back the region. And it's really important that we expand that region. I'm delighted this, to say that the Secretary of State is very open to those conversations and very open to renegotiating that devolution deal so that we get the investment that we need. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Stephen, commitment to get North Somerset involved? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, in, initially, as being treated effectively as, as, as an equal partner, though legally not part of the combined authority, and then working to make sure that by the time we get to the next election, they are a full participant in, in, in the combined authority. Um, I have to correct, Dan, though I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, that the council election in North Somerset was in 2019, when the previous Conservative administration that did indeed decide not to join in 2017 was ejected and replaced by a cross-party uh, coalition that does include Labour councillors. There are Labour councillors in North Somerset who wanted to join the, the, the combined authority. They've made it clear for the last two years they wanted to be a member of the combined authority, thought they were proceeding in good faith uh, with the other councils in the region, but it was Marvin Rees who willfully refused to okay. start the formal legal process of a public consultation until November last year when it was too late to bring them in. So it was political chicanery that has kept them out this time round. But as I say, all of this will soon nope. be behind us. No, you get no right to return, Dan. Sorry, not now. If it happened earlier, you would have had it. But now, if you want to pick it up in your 90 seconds final, you can do so. I wouldn't advise you to do that. But I mean, you know, it's entirely up to you, obviously, how you use your final 90 seconds. So that brings Q&A to a close. Thank you uh, to our candidates and indeed uh, all the questions. We covered a lot of ground there in, 
in the time allotted. Um, so what we'll do is uh, similar to the opening statements, each candidate will get uh, 90 seconds to say anything that they want to say that they haven't said or to reiterate things that they've said already. I'll stick my hand up again when you've got your 20 seconds and we're gonna do it in the reverse order to the opening statement. So that'll be in a moment, that'll be Samuel, then Stephen, uh, then Jerome, and then finally um, Dan. So if you're ready, uh, Samuel, uh, away you go. Well, can I just thank you all for being part of this conversation this afternoon and a huge, uh, this morning, and a huge ground uh, covered, which has been really fantastic. And I think is symbolic of the aspiration and hope that we have for our region. And it's right to have aspiration, ambition, and hope as we emerge from the impacts of COVID so that we can restore the economy, so that we can create jobs, so that we can start to trade internationally and domestically and start taking our rightful place on the stage as a leading economy in green innovations, in, in new opportunities, and uh, taking hold of that, that hope. And for that, we need someone who understands business, who doesn't just talk about it theoretically, but has been down in the dirt and built up businesses, created jobs, worked with government for good and bad, to push hard and to work collaboratively with. We need a region that thrives, both for urban and rural areas. And I'm that person to do that. So as I started off by saying, now is not the time to risk our recovery. It's time to seize opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Samuel. And we'll move to Stephen, your final 90 seconds when you're ready. Okay. Well, I'm ambitious for this region and I, I've got an ambitious plan on, on, in order to transform our region by 2030. So please, after you've You've heard my fellow candidates do do have a look on my website, stevenwilliams.org.uk, for my detailed manifesto, which is called Agenda 2030, and sets out how I want to transition our region to be the country's first carbon neutral economy by 2030. Ambitious plans in transport, housing, the local economy, skills, but above all, uh, how we can champion this region as well. This is about leadership locally, and I spoke earlier how I believe in collaboration, how I want to work with people from all political parties in this region and our neighbours as well. But to succeed, we need someone who can be a champion on the national and the international stage, because that's what we've been sorely lacking for the last four years. Having been an MP, being a government minister, I've got those key relationships still in Westminster and Whitehall, and I know how the system works. We've got a lot of ground to make up in this region, just to catch up with what our other metro regions have achieved in the last four years. So please support me in order to be our local champion, but our national champion as well. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, Jerome, when you're ready. Thank you. Yep. So like, like Stephen and like the other candidates, uh, my manifesto is available on, on my website. So if you Google me, I'm sure that will come up, Jerome for metromayor.co.uk. Um, and it will be an amazing asset for the West of England to have the country's first green metro mayor. It will send the strongest possible message to the government and the wider world that people in our region want a green future. I will be able to get a better deal from government than former Labour and um, Conservative, than former Labour and Lib Dem uh, MPs, who I really don't believe will be taken particularly seriously by government. We know that green ideas that were once considered impractical, like wind turbines or electric cars, are now mainstream and established. So we've got the green solutions to hand to achieve our ambitious targets and to secure a recovery that works for everybody. We now need a pace and speed of change that is green. Greens came up with these ideas originally. We're now the people to be implementing them. Growing more local food, insulating our homes, improving public transport, generating renewable energy. And I strongly believe that if we want to have those green solutions and the absolute commitment, if you want a green region, vote green. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jerome. And 
Lastly, Dan, so you're 90 seconds when you're ready. Thank you, Andrew, and thank everyone for listening today, uh, especially as you're so busy. Um, I'm not gonna say too much, really. I think what I just want to say is that our area is great. It's got an amazing history, amazingly talented people, but it also has challenges. But I think our future can be even brighter still if there's the right leadership, if there's the right person in the West of England Metro Mayor Combined Authority leading from the front, showing strong leadership, making decisions. Those decisions won't always be popular, I know, but you all understand about leadership as business leaders. You get that completely. Uh, but what matters is that we are out there, recognised in the country and globally, so that people can see the talents and the things that we've been able to contribute in the past and the, and the great things we can do in the future, not just for our own area, but wider and beyond and make wealth in the process. So I hope that you agree with me. If you do, I hope you'll support me, obviously. Uh, John Savage has endorsed me. Uh, I think his endorsement is a hugely important one. Um, he recognises and understands business as you do. Uh, I think it's really, really, really important that we start getting on with things now. We have got a gap to make up. It's absolutely true. Uh, and then we need to boost and, and go really fast forward uh, so that we catch up and then show what we're really about. I'm very proud of our area uh, and I will do my best uh, if I'm chosen uh, to do that. Uh, thank you for your time today. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, um, Dan. And indeed, um, thanks to all candidates for um, t attending. Uh, I'd like to uh, wish them good luck in the, you know, the last week or so of electioneering. It's a hard slog, but whoever wins, I'm sure it'll be, be worth it. I'd like to thank Business West for working with us on the event. Thank you very much for uh, being brilliant uh, partners with us. I'd like to thank you all for attending and your great questions. As I said, the start a recording of the event, if you want to listen to it again, will be available on our website, centerforcities.org. And then finally, um, and I think this is an important point, um, don't forget to vote. Uh, and indeed, don't forget to, to get everybody who's eligible to vote, to vote. You know, in a sense, you want your mayor to have the biggest possible election mandate that they can have. So when they enter into conversations outside of the patch and indeed inside, but certainly outside of the patch, they carry the weight of the electorate with them. I can't stress this enough. It's an important point that needs to be made. And the mayor will need all the support and help they, they, they need in order to, to do that. So please do when the time comes on May the 6th, please do get out and vote. So with that, I say thank you again for coming to our candidates, to Business West and for everyone else. Stay safe and go well. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye.